minutes so that uh, some more people just uh, join in Oh uh, yes, sir. Uh, if you want to begin, you can begin. Okay, then uh, you can stop sharing so that uh, the screen will. Mansi ji, hello. Oh uh, yes, you can start your sharing. Uh, I, okay. Okay, fine. Uh, yes, I can see it. Uh, and you can also run the polls whenever uh, required. I've given you the rights. Okay. Okay, so it has started, right? Yes. Okay, it's uh, so uh, welcome everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Everything is clear. So, uh, uh, Happy New Year to everyone. So it's after a bit of a gap, we are rejoining. Welcome to this third module of Fine Neurophilia series. We have completed the stroke modules, that is two modules of stroke basics and stroke advanced series. Now we are planning to complete this dementia, which is a bit tougher one. Uh, and uh, we'll complete it as dementia basics and dementia advanced. So I'll uh, again, again, I'll be planning, I'll tell you that uh, I'm not just uh, giving you a capsule form of what dementia is in Harrison and uh, Bradley. But what I'm planning to do is to make you uh, read Harrison and Bradley as far as possible. So, and also uh, would like you to clear some uh, concepts in dementia so that it, it's easy for you to read dementia and understand it in a better way. And uh, as you know, we had done a stroke last time and we had done an exam on stroke uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, about 105 people answering the stroke questions and of which we had about top 10 uh, we the excellent performance by our uh, students about 10 are there uh, chitrangana anika satya sumita mallikarjuna usha hari santosh Iqbal, and john uh, excellent uh, you keep it up this uh, keep this per performance up and I hope that you all, uh, those who have uh, done this test, all of them get the coming NEET exam all the, or the institute exam. And uh, wish you all, all the best. And more people, let them, uh, after this dementia module also, let them uh, come and uh, write these exams. So uh, let's start this dementia module. As you know, dementia is uh, not that easy. It's a bit tough. Uh, so let's make this a bit interesting one and also an interactive one. Uh, so I'll, this is actually, I, as you know, it's actually a, a question and answer session. So uh, you put your best, you try to answer the question. So I have put up a poll question uh, in which uh, I would like you to answer this question. How many neurons are there in the cerebrum of the human brain? So read the question every time you get the question. How many quest, uh, neurons are there in the cerebrum of the human brain? So this is a tricky question, mind bending question. Uh, so with this, I wanted to introduce you to the intricacies of the brain and how the brain is functioning. So carefully answer the question. You know that in stroke about 1.2 million neurons, 1.2 million, not billion, 1.2 million neurons are actually get uh, getting damaged each minute. So how many, total neurons are there in the cerebrum of human brain. So I think enough of people have answered. So most of them have answered as uh, 120 billion. Yeah, that is actually likely wrong answer. Uh, so actually, uh, you should know that uh, number of neurons in the human brain is amounting to about 85 billion and uh, of which about 15 billion are present in the cerebrum and about 70 billion are present in the cerebellum. 
and uh, if you uh, this is actually based on the statistics from the uh, relevant data which i am telling you so cerebellum has about five times uh, neurons as in the cerebrum that is in the telencephalon and you should know that uh, this brain has got neurons as well as other cells that is non neuron cells non neuron cells will include microglia that will include the oligodendroglia the astrocytes the appendocyte ependymal ependal ependymal cells etc and the number of neurons as we have discussed is 15 billion in the cerebrum about 70 billion in the uh, cerebellum about 1 billion in the brain stem so uh, about uh, all to all total about 85 to 86 billion and about 10 times these cells are uh, actually 10 times these uh, neurons uh, the microglial cells are present in the uh, brain and of which each neuron has got about 15000 synapses the importance of these numericals is that one neuron gets about 15000 synapses and this is concerned with the uh, this synaptogenesis is concerned with the memory formation or the what we con we are concerned with the cognition so that is importance of cognition so each thing we learn we listen to this uh, lecture so some synapses are being formed and each synapses uh, each neuron produces about 15000 synapses uh, to form a uh, memory or a information and uh, which gets encoded and gets uh, fixed in within the brain so that was the first question you had and uh, this was uh, actually from the data so uh, if you read harrison you will uh, know all kinds of diseases uh, affecting the brain especially in dementia if you read you will see alzheimer's disease frontotemporal dementia etc etc but uh, i would like to say that you should get to know some uh, functioning of the brain that is the functionality of the brain before you get to know about the diseases so in the first class of stroke we learned that about the broadman's uh, area that is uh, the functional small functional areas within the brain which are uh, located within the brain which has a specific function so broadman divided into 52 areas so like that grossly uh, functional areas are also there within the brain for cognition also so let's just see how you can you try to answer this uh, question so uh, let's see how you can you give your question so i think uh, the poll has come hope you can see the poll so uh, this was about a 56 year old female uh, who presented with difficulty in cooking she was ap apparently normal then later she developed difficulty in cooking she was unable to collect necessary ingredients for cooking so for example a curry or sambar or kichdi so, and she was unable to judge the quantity correctly add the ingredients in sequence and was unable to set the uh, breakfast which was supposed to be set by about 10 am she was able to set early by uh, afternoon and uh, she was uh, not allowed to go to the kitchen after the, she was found to be grossly unable to uh, function in that way and what is this dysfunction and where will you localize this uh, problem to so whether is it, is it a problem in the frontal lobe the temporal lobe the parietal lobe or the occipital lobe grossly that will be the uh, first question i'll be asking you but i have made it a bit tough so that i'll uh, uh, with this question i will be able to uh, help explain to you how, how this functions so this is a lady who is unable to do her functions properly in sequence so what is the answer you would like to give so most of them have given the answer correctly uh, so this is actually a, a dysfunction of the executive function so she is unable to do a things in sequence so this is actually a executive dysfunction and executive dysfunction is a dysfunction of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex so if you grossly see the functionality of the brain uh you can see this is the frontal lobe that is anterior to the central sulcus and posterior is the parietal and this between below the uh, sylvian sulcus is the temporal lobe which is concerned mainly with the memory parietal is associated with the visuo spatial function these are not clear cut areas they have they are actually interconnect interconnected areas so they have function uh, the they are there is intermixing of the functions actually and occipital is as you know is concerned with the vision but this is actually uh, further as we had seen in the broadman's area we have just uh, i put this slide so that you just revise 
through all these which we had studied during the stroke because these are repeat questions which comes every time so gross functionality was described by luria he said that every input which comes to the brain comes through the brain stem that is the block 1 you see here the block 1 the block 1 which includes the reticular activating system which is present in the brain stem which is processed by the block 2 which is includes the temporal parietal and the occipital lobe which the area gets encoded and then what to do with these inputs is decided by the frontal lobe which acts on it so this is the luria's three functional blocks uh, which we see so uh, some questions are there in aims question which came regarding the luria uh, luria actually uh, had dealt with mainly the frontal lobe functions so luria had done uh, test with luria's fist edge palm test or the luria sequencing test was done uh, is mainly done for frontal lobe function and frontal lobe anatomy as you know is primary motor cortex that is the uh, motor cortex then there is a premotor area supplementary motor area frontal area so and prefrontal area is further we have the dorso dorsal pre, uh, dorsal prefrontal cortex orbito frontal cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex so if you see the cross section like this this is the dorsal prefrontal cortex and this is the me medial prefrontal cortex and this is the orbital prefrontal so dorsal is associated with the executive function and if something goes wrong in that as we had seen in our patient the patient gets the dis executive function this executive syndrome and if there is something wrong with the mesial side or the medial side the patient has decreased motivation remember m for m so motivation motivation is lost and the patient becomes apathetic and that form uh, the patient gets an apathetic syndrome and orbito frontal patient gets disinhibitive syndrome so that patient will be having a behavioral disturbance social uh, problems and will be having a impulsive kind of behavior so remember like this dorsal means medial and orbito frontal so every part so i have just described the frontal part frontal lobe for you so you uh, similarly you have to somehow try to learn regarding the memory the apraxia agnosia some connections regarding alexia etc etc are there which are actually uh, would be asked in the institute exams basically rather than in the uh, neat exam and uh, we'll in the advanced class we'll try to touch upon a few points but before starting the topic proper i thought i should uh, tell you regarding the importance of these topics uh, which are actually regard, regarding the cognition part so uh, this is regarding uh, cognition so let's see what dementia is so dementia uh, is actually the word meaning is actually madness or insanity so that is why dsm 5 classification has changed the term from dementia to what is called as a major cognitive disorder so what is major cognitive disorder is, is actually memory impairment with some other domains getting affected and which affects our activities of daily living so the memory impairment if it doesn't affect our activities of daily living it is otherwise called as mild neurocognitive disorder so the term dementia is not uh, now uh, clinically used in classification it is actually called as major neurocognitive disorder so this is actually the term the, so the memory impairment is there and if we, along with it one more area is getting affected either aphasia apraxia disturbance in executive function which cannot be explained by delirium or any psychiatric or medical issues and which definitely affects the activities of daily living so activities of daily living will include the social and occupational thing so such a thing will is now termed as dementia or major neurocognitive impairment so this degenerative diseases the most common one this is a frequently asked question the most common uh, and degenerative disease is actually the alzheimer's disease followed by dementia second most common is uh, dementia with lewy body and then comes the vascular cognitive uh, impairment and then ftd so if you see uh, the part of the brain if you see this as we had seen we have to study all the parts we had just touched upon the frontal area 
in alchemist disease actually there is impairment of the temporal initially followed by parietal and frontal part and in frontal temporal dementia as the name indicates itself there is frontal first followed by temporal and in the diffuse lewy body disease diffuse the name itself says diffuse so there is diffuse involvement of uh, brain with even involvement of occipital lobe diffuse lewy body disease and in case of posterior cortical atrophy variant of alzheimer's disease we have involvement of occipital lobe first so this is actually uh, selective involvement of certain areas of the brain are important in differentiating certain diseases of uh, cert uh, certain types of dementia so this was uh, what i was telling in frontal temporal dementia and alzheimer's disease both of them we have involvement of frontal and temporal regions but as we can see here in frontal temporal dementia there is more of frontal involvement than the temporal involvement and in temporal in alzheimer's disease there is more of temporal involvement rather than the frontal involvement and uh, as we see this is a case of cortico basal degeneration in, we can, in this we can see there is asymmetric uh, cortical involvement along with there is basal involvement and this is a case of vascular dementia we can see white matter involvement and there is atrophy so that part is actually uh, pulled in pulled out pulled in actually because of atrophy to that area so uh, with uh, actually this aging aging also there is dementia then we have discussed regarding mild cognitive impairment then comes the dementia or the major cognitive impairment so this is actually a continuum so what is difference in um, normal aging mci that is mild cognitive impairment and major cognitive impairment so uh, any, uh, let's uh, try to answer this question so in aging this actually ha has been taken from harrison uh, this line has been taken from harrison which of the following is a incorrect statement regarding normal aging so whether with aging general knowledge and vocabulary remain stable or it improves problem solving and reasoning will decline uh, age related decline occurs uh, primarily in speed working memory and encoding there is decline in learning acquisition performance with delayed recall uh, severity affected uh, sorry there is actually in poll i can see one more word actually that's not there for glycosaminoglycans is not there this came from another poll sorry so the last line would be declining learning and acquisition performance with delayed recall severely affected that's all with delayed recall severely affected so this question has been put to emphasize just the fact that first so that's enough so first three sentences are actually typical of what we see in case of a age related degeneration age delay, age related memory impairment but the third sentence if you see the first part of the third sentence is actually correct first part of the third sentence says, says that there is actually decline in the learning and acquisition performance that's true but in what happens is delayed recall is not severely affected it's actually preserved but in alzheimer's disease this delayed recall is actually affected first so if you tell a few numbers and ask to uh, uh, tell after about uh, two minutes or three minutes uh, in case of age related they may be able to tell but in case of uh, alzheimer's disease it will be affected very early so that is the difference in case of normal aging versus uh, alzheimer's disease so these are each lines are been taken from harrison and this can be uh, this are uh, easily can be made into a question so in this is a repeat question uh, in mci memory loss becomes uh, actually in, when we do a standardized memory test what when will you call it a mci that is my minimal or mild cognitive impairment so try to answer this question so uh, can you see this question in minimal cognitive impairment memory loss becomes when there is dashed standard deviation below normal on standard memory tests 
okay most of them have uh, done it correctly so it is actually 1.5 uh, standard uh, deviation so the, this is actually importance of the concept of minimal cognitive impairment so before the patient can be termed as a uh, major cognitive impairment or patient getting dementia there is a entity called minimal cognitive impairment and also and uh, this is actually in between term that is in between uh, normal cognition and major cognitive impairment and it has actually two types that is amnestic variety and an anamnestic variety so amnestic variety as the name itself suggests is actually impairment in the memory and anamnestic is without impairment in the memory so i have answered this question so i i don't think there is a need of poll for this question so the criteria for this uh, anamnestic mci include uh, impairment all the ex domains except so criteria for anamnestic mci include impairment of all the following except so you know the answer i have discussed that is two types of mci are there that is mild cognitive impairment that is anamnestic and amnestic so what we are asking in this question what is this anamnestic mci criteria and what doesn't include under this so actually memory includes is included under amnestic mci and not under an amnestic mci so as we know actually this is uh, am amnestic mci that is the memory memory mci i i will like you to remember as a mem memory mci actually progresses into alzheimer's disease and the anamnestic non amnestic or anamnestic mci progresses into the other types of uh, dementias like frontotemporal dementia and dementia with lewy bodies so usually about mci patients by a, every year about 10 to 15 percentage they have a risk of developing into either categories either alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementias each of this can be framed into questions so that you learn the concept very thoroughly and uh, so in in 1906 next question is in 1906 uh, so this question we had asked previously uh, in 1906 a german psychiatrist described uh, regarding uh, a patient in a psychiatric unit for uh, and described alzheimer's disease in that patient and uh, it was described in a woman named can I answer the poll 19 not says six a uh, german psychiatrist did describe ad so this uh, just uh, read the question properly before answering uh, that's why some people are making mistake in this question uh, it, the question is asked on which patient we had asked the uh, in on which patient is uh, this the disease described on Oh, actually, I have got wonderful answers. Also, two uh, extreme answers. Actually, all options have been marked: Agastya Ditta, Alois Alshima, Mesulam, Louis Victor Libogne. Okay. Okay. So let's see. I have put each each. person each name uh, here actually has got it, uh, his or her or importance in the field of cognition so the answer is actually agastya ditta about 60 percentage of them have correct, given the correct answer so i'll tell you that this uh, lady was actually uh, admitted in a psychiatry asylum asylum mental asylum and uh, uh, alois alshimers uh, had diagnose alzheimer's disease he was actually a neuropathologist he actually described alzheimer's disease in this patient and who was mesulam mesulam was the one who had described the progressive aphasias you have heard about logopenic variant of aphasia primary progressive variant uh, that is the semantic variant of aphasia non fluent variant of aphasia all were described by mesulam and who is this louis vector libogne so as we had described about, about agastya ditta she was a patient louis victor libogne was also a patient he was actually a patient of our uh, paul broca so broca described uh, the broca area was described first in actually louis victor libogne this patient could only tell the word tan so his nickname was tan and uh, he had actually right sided weakness 
so uh, this patient uh, this actually louis had right sided bigness and could only tell the word tan and broca knew that he had no much of a cognitive decline but could only express the word tan and with this broca was interviewed he looked after this patient and when the patient died autopsy was done and was found that the patient was having a frontal lobe tumor and broca found out that actually this tumor in the broca area had caused actually the patient to have a broca aphasia and that is why the patient was able to tell only a single word and that was tan so that was regarding this importance importance of this all three words so this is alois elshimer uh, who was a german psychiatrist who described elshimer's disease with its pathology that is neuronal loss flakes and tangles on agaste ditter so as we know the elshimer's disease uh, right now it's actually a clinical diagnosis but now lots of studies are going on and lots of questions are coming regarding the biomarkers in elshimer's disease so uh, this is actually a commonly asked question a person with biomarker evidence of elshimer's disease that is amyloid Im imaging is positive pet is positive uh, there is a beta 2 decrease elevated tau and there is no symptoms what will we call this patient so i think uh, uh, we'll uh, i think we'll skip the poll uh, for the want of time actually this patient is called prodromal lady this i had taken uh, from actually the harrison so this is actually prodromal lady so actually early symptomatic ad and mca are actually similarly overlapping terms in early symptomatic ad and mca if you test the patient actually the patient uh will be uh, normal and the uh, patient will have some abnormality that is about 1.5 standard deviation we had described described in the previous question but he will be functionally compensated compensated that is his activities of daily living will be normal but in prodromal ad there is nothing wrong with the patient except that when he was uh, worked up he found was found to be having a uh, biomarker for elshimer's disease that is regarding this concept and regarding the genetics of elshimer's disease let's try to solve this question so this is question number 8 so uh, try to answer this question uh, I, i all you know is actually apoe4 allele is increases the risk of alzheimer's disease so if you have a single allele it increases the risk from 2 to 3 fold so if you have both the alleles how many fold will the risk increase whether it's 4 fold 8 fold 16 fold or 324 so actually i think uh, 90% of uh, all attending this have uh, told, uh, told the answer correctly uh, it is actually 16 fold so i'll share a few facts regarding uh, e4 allele so e4 allele are notorious or a common risk factor for alzheimer's disease so there are other alleles also there is e3 allele and e2 allele and out of which e2 allele e2 allele is found to be protective e2 allele is found to be protective but e4 allele is actually destructive for ca in case of alzheimer's disease and uh, which of the following is the most common uh, cause of early onset alzheimer's disease is it amyloid precursor protein is it presenilin 1 is it presenilin 2 or is it apo e gene so i think this is a this is a commonly asked repeat question those who are uh, seeing the uh, i think all will be happy seeing the question most of them will be having the answer in their mind they can just shoot the answer yes but 80 percentage have answered it oh it's coming down okay so we have always see the question properly it's not actually simple alzheimer's disease or late onset alzheimer's disease we are asking regarding early onset alzheimer's disease uh, so the answer is actually uh, presenilin 1 so early onset alzheimer's disease has actually more of a genetic cause uh, rather than uh, if it was a common alzheimer's disease apoe would be, have been an answer this is a common area of mcqs more lots of mcqs comes in this area so don't miss this uh, concept so uh, 
see this chart properly. So uh, learn all these chromosomes also. So chroma chromosome 21 is uh, responsible for amyloid precursor protein, uh, 14 for presenlin 1, 1 for presenlin 2, 19 is responsible for APOE. And uh, most common cause of Alzheimer's, always remember it is actually APOE. There is no doubt regarding that. In case of early onset, remember actually it is presenilin uh, 1. So presenilin 1 will be most common. That is in the chromosome 14. So don't forget that uh, fact uh, and check the question always when that uh, kind of question is asked. So that was regarding genetics of AAD. There is also more, more advanced genetics, even in Harrison, some new advanced genetics regarding uh, Alzheimer's disease are described. For example, I'll tell you one question regarding TREM2 mutation is there. And uh, one disease called Nasu Hakola, Hakola disease is there. Uh, you don't think that it's very rare and all. We recently had a patient with uh, this kind of TREM2 mutation positive in our hospital. So that's when I realized that all these things in Harrison are not just uh, facts or this hi-fi stuff. It can be true also. So that's why these questions come. So such an examiner gets uh, such kind of patient in his uh, clinics or in his OPD or in his IP, then that question comes in the next exam. So be careful about that. So uh, that's why I told you that. And uh, regarding this basic concept, Atrophy in amnestic Alzheimer's disease begins initially at uh, which part? So I think uh, all should get this answer correct. Uh, please get your answer. Please uh, put your answer. Yes. Please read the question properly. Uh, this shouldn't, uh, nobody should make mistake in this question. Uh, question because uh, this is a very basic question read uh, so what i have seen in this first 10 questions is that uh, you're not reading the question so we make sure you read take time to read your question because one minute would have been allotted for you to read the question so this is a simple question nobody should lose marks on yes actually 86 percentage have got the answer correctly it's actually medial temporal uh, region which is the first area to get affected. So uh, as you see, there is atrophy of the medial temporal uh, region and there is widening of the ventricle in this region. And further, there is shrinkage of the cortex. Uh, these are all basic basic things in, in MBBS or MD level you would have studied. So why this happens, we'll learn in the subsequent. So this class is basically to solve this concept. This question is the basic uh, one question which I wanted to clear. The concept behind this question was the one I intended to clear this class on. So try to solve this question. If you don't know, it's okay, but give it a try it's because uh, I want you to give it a try. This amyloid precursor protein, don't think it as a hi-fi question. Uh, just give it a try. Then only you can build over it. So as you know, amyloid precursor protein, we have heard that it is in chromosome 21. It is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so what do you think? Amyloid precursor protein in Alzheimer's disease is cleared by all except. Uh, yes, actually most of them have answered it correctly, but some have a doubt whether it's alpha, beta or gamma secretases. Yes. So I want everyone to just sit, sit back, take a deep breath and uh, just listen to me for a few seconds because I want to all of you to listen to this because uh, this concept has been there in uh, Harrison as well as Bradley. I want you to know about it actually. So in Harrison uh, and Bradley, about Alzheimer's disease, you know, there is actually two, two causes. That is why Alzheimer's disease occurs is because of these two things amyloid plagues and neurofibrillary tangles. I have tried to simplify it for you. These amyloid plagues, as we can see here in neurons, there is neuro, normal neurons, there is nothing you can see. But in Alzheimer's disease, you can see these amyloid plagues, which are actually extracellular. These are neurons, so extra neuronal or extracellular. 
and in neurofibrillary tangles are within the neurons that is nfts are within the neurons so intraneuronal or intracellular so these all can comes uh, come as sentence questions true or false kind of questions so amyloid plaques are extracellular neurofibrillary triangles are intracellular so why what why this happens why this happens we'll see so what we see this is actually the amyloid precursor protein amyloid precursor protein and as you have seen it is present it is originating from the chromosome 21 what is this function of this amyloid precursor protein it is actually a normal poor protein which is present within the neuronal membrane it has a function within the membrane the function of this neuro protein within the membrane is to produce synapses initially in the first question we had seen that the, all the neurons has to produce synapses has to uh, have a neuronal migration because it has to develop for a child to develop into an adult it has to have neuronal migration also it has to help in transport of ion all this example ion transport ion transport that is fer ferric ion ion transport all this hel is helped by this app amyloid precursor protein so this is present on the neuronal membrane but what happens is that once this uh, app is actually functioned well in uh, its function has uh, uh, got over it has functioned adequately well and it is about to die it has to be normally lysed and disposed of so normal cell has got certain ways of cleaving it off and disposing of without any much of a trouble to the body so this is actually regarding the function so synaptogenesis neuronal migration cell adhesion and also ion transport so any of this is affected then the cells become damaged so ion if gets accumulated it causes neurotoxicity etc etc so what happens that was regarding amyloid precursor protein so when it becomes old it has to be degraded so no our body has normal methods to degrade it off there are two pathways one is the non amyloidogenic pathway the other is the amyloidogenic pathway in non amyloidogenic pathway two enzymes cut the two scissors cut these app into two parts alpha and gamma which are i don't want you to remember the names and all but they Equally, equally fragments uh, and easily gets disposed of. No problem regarding that. In amyloidogenic pathway also, usually there is no much of a problem, but the usually it is acted on by beta and gamma. So here, what happens is because of some uh, the, because of this uh, amyloidogenic pathway, there is something called amyloid beta monomer, or we call it as A beta, which we usually hear here, A beta. a beta is produced in a normal human being uh, no, without any problem usually this amyloid beta will be cleaved by the microglia the other astrocytes and some enzymes etc will cleave these cells and there is no there will be no much of a problem but in case of some mutations or some disease and all what happens is that uh, this a beta increases in number and they become beta oligomers they clump together and become beta oligomers and that is how these senile plaques or amyloid plaques are formed and amyloid plaques once formed as we have seen they are present within in between the cells and they block the neurotransmitters so neurotransmitters are included needed for transmission within the cell in between the cell and they block the neurotransmitter and hence block all the synaptogenesis all the synaptic transmission etc so that is the problem with the amyloid trans, uh, amyloid plaques within the cell so that is regarding amyloid plaques or senile plaques now we told about one more thing that is actually uh, neurofibrillary tangles so what we have seen is that actually inside the cell you have seen that uh, uh, there is a soma and there is an axon we have seen a soma and axon so in the cell body every material has to be brought into the end of the dendrite and also some things have to be brought from the end to the soma so this is acting or occurring through a pipes called the microtubules and you know uh, this microtubules are strengthened with the help of tau this actually you can think uh, you can uh, analogy can be given to these pipes pipes strengthened with tau this tau can be thought of as ropes so tau has got phosphor uh, this phosphokinases are there in tau which binds these areas together so what happens is that 
due to disease this kinases become hyperphosphorylated so you think that these ropes become broken what happens to the when when ropes become broken actually these microfilaments or tubes become broken and these tau's become the ropes ropes become hyper accumulated together that is hyperphosphorylated tau becomes accumulated that is neurofibrillary tangles are formed nft neurofibrillary tangles are formed and these tubes these tubes microfilaments becomes disintegrated so there is no transport there is actually no anterograde or retrograde flow within the cell so the cell usually dies the neuron dies so this is what happens within the neurons so these two things that is senoidal plaques or amyloid plaques neurofibrillary tangles occurs within the alzheimers uh, occurs within the alzheimers now if you see this uh, picture within the in bradley i think it will be more easy in non amyloidogenic pathway you saw alpha and gamma it cleaves to produce non toxic particles in amyloidogenic pathway also beta and gamma it also produces non uh, amyloid non toxic particles but sometimes this a beta gets accumulated to produce plaques it's, it's very simple as such there is no confusion so this actually is a simple diagram uh, no need to study all this and all if you want you can go uh, read much deep into it but uh, i think that will be enough and alzheimers one more thing is that there is enzyme deficiency this enzyme is deficient that's all that's why we give donapacil to supplement for this enzyme because this uh, neuron is damaged so dysfunctional cholinergic neurons so we try to uh, supplement it with the help of donapacil so this if you have got this pathophysiology right every question coming from after this that is uh, any question coming after this pathophysiology you will be able to answer so biomarkers of uh, neuronal injury so try to answer this question uh, if you have an uh, I, I, it's very we had don't have much time so that's why we'll go on so try to answer this question biomarkers of neuronal injury in alzheimer's disease include all except is it increased tau increased csf beta for a beta 42 hippocampal atrophy abnormality in the fdg pet metabolism okay i think uh, uh, yes you have done it correctly but increased a beta 42 is not is actually the wrong answer yes so what why why actually you studied the pathophysiology and you got the answer that actually a beta 42 is increasing so why it is actually not coming in csf because inside the brain it is increasing but it is not it is get increasing in the brain but is not coming in the csf so actually csf beta a beta 42 is increasing within the brain but it is not seeping into the csf because it's getting clumped and increasing in number and what we actually see in alzheimer's disease uh, is actually a ratio of a beta 42 versus a beta 40 and uh, as you saw that csf tau is actually the our clump drops we had seen in that and hippocampal atrophy is actually the net result of all the cells dying and also the because the cells are dying in the mri or the fdg pet we get the hypometabolism so uh, we think that increase there will be cs of a beta 42 increase because the cs of a because a beta 42 increase during the pathophysiology or the damage of uh, in alzheimer's disease but but a, a beta 42 increases and clumps together and gets stuck within the brain and doesn't seep into the csf but the others a beta 40 a beta 37 a beta 38 etc seep out but a, uh, a beta 42 does not so if you see ideal thing is to see the ratio of a beta 42 to a beta any others so best is to see for a beta 42 by a beta 40 hope you got the concept and in alzheimer's disease routine csf is normal so your routine things uh, blood cells proteins etc are normal so which abnormality uh, will suggest this is actually a repeat question which i am asking you uh, which uh, abnormality uh, will you will suggest that the patient has got 
uh, Alzheimer's disease. So try to answer a simple question. Yes, actually 100% have answered it correctly. Yes, yes. So, so there is no doubt if such a question comes in the next exam, I'm sure all of you, oh, yeah. if you have got it wrong. I told you actually CSF uh, tau won't get reduced. Tau actually comes down through the CSF and it will be increased. So remember that CSF A beta 42 will be reduced because it's clumped and stays within the brain. CSF A, B, A beta 40, 37, 38, 80, et cetera, will increase along with phosphor, hyperphosphorylated tau. So remember that concept. I just put that question to reinforce that fact uh, regarding this uh, pathophysiology. So uh, next question. In Alzheimer's disease, cognitive changes follow a characteristic pattern. So as we have seen with the pathophysiology, there is atrophy, the neurons get damaged. Where is the maximum neuronal damage? And what is the first thing which we see in Alzheimer's disease? So uh, uh, question number 14. Okay, try to answer this question. What do you think? Just take your time and read. So there is a pattern of cognitive change. So there is a uh, progression of the disease from mild to moderate uh, to severe in case of Alzheimer's disease. We call it by a name of this kind of prog progression. I'll tell you later what is this kind of progression we call. It's called a staging is there. Yes, I think 50% uh, of them have got the answer correctly. Yes, actually. It's memory followed by language, followed by visual spatial, then executing. So as we have seen, uh, it is actually temporal uh, followed by inferior frontal, then parietal occurs, then dorsolateral prefrontal cortex gets affected in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So this is the correct sequence of uh, progression. So if you see, this is mild, first there is actually short term, followed by language, all we have seen. So this, uh, this actually, this table, uh, this actually I had taken from uh, Harrison, the page cut, this page has been taken from Harrison. And uh, this staging is actually called a Bragg staging of diseases. So Bragg staging of diseases, uh, if anyone can comment in the chat box, you can do that. Uh, it's used in which disease actually? Uh, this is actually a simple question. Uh, I know everyone would answer this is Alzheimer's disease. Any other disease in which Bragg staging is used? Bragg and Bragg staging. Please comment in the chat box just to reinforce yourself. Okay. So actually these are the four, six stages are there in Bragg and Bragg staging. That is trans entorenal stages in the, which the patient will be asymptomatic. Then the uh, limbic stages then the, it spreads in the cortical stages where the patient will be having the major cognitive impairment. So uh, which of the following is not a, a typical variant of uh, Alzheimer's disease? So we have seen that there is a typical variant of Alzheimer's disease in which the disease spread from the temporal lobe to inferior frontal, then the parietal, and then to the uh, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal. And the occipital lobe gets affected the last so when there is a change in pattern of such kind of an occurrence, so if uh, actually occipital gets uh, uh, affected first, or if language area gets affected first rather than memory, or uh, what do you call it, frontal area gets affected rather than memory, then we call it as an atypical variant of AD because the pathology will be a Lewy body pathology. So that is why we term it as an atypical variant of AD. So out of which we have given here, uh, which is an atypical variant of, uh, which is not an atypical variant of AD. So even uh, some have answered as frontal variant of AD, I have written, some have answered as frontal variant of AD. Actually, it's not an atypical variant of AD, I have answered, I have asked. Okay, be careful every time you uh, read the question and answer, uh, try to rule out at least if you don't know the answer. So the answer is actually, 
uh, semantic variant of aphasia. So I'll tell you why the answer is so. So the atypical variants of AD are actually frontal variant. That is the Alzheimer's pathology starts in the frontal area, then slowly goes to the uh, memory part. Then Benson syndrome is other name of the posterior cortical variant of AD. So I just put, the, for your knowledge, I just added it. Benson syndrome, actually posterior cortical variant of AD. It was named by Benson, uh, it discovered by Benson. That is why it is otherwise known as Benson syndrome. And logopenic variant of aphasia. Previously, uh, this progressive variant of aphasia was put under frontotemporal dementia. But now, because of pathology is due to kind of Alzheimer's pathology, it is now regrouped as a logopenic. This logopenic variant of aphasia is regrouped now as a Alzheimer's pathology. That is Alzheimer's variant and not as a frontotemporal variant. And semantic variant of PPA, primary progressive aphasia, and the non fluent variety are actually part of FTD, that is frontotemporal dementia. So, in this, the answer is actually. Uh, which is not a, a typical variant of AD is actually semantic variant of aphasia. So it's a bit tough question, but uh, I, I'm happy that you have attempted. So now you, I think you, since you made a mistake, you will never forget this uh, question for sure. So these are the typical variants. You can read through. This is actually there in uh, Harrison itself. Uh, they are written and uh, posterior cortical atrophy because the occipital, there will be occipital atrophy and you can see all sorts of uh, syndromes, balance syndrome. Actually, one patient had uh, came to uh, came to me and patient had severe visual uh, impairment. And we had initially sent the patient to ophthalmologist thinking that patient has uh, visual problem. It can even mimic a malingering because a ophthalmologist will send us back the patient saying that the patient is, does, doesn't have any problem. And the frontal variant of AD will mimic a frontotemporal dementia and uh, like that. So that is regarding the atypical variants. So uh, we were discussing previously regarding the genetics of AD in which we had told that actually uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease, the most common variety uh, cause was actually presenilin 1 that is due to the chrome, which is present in the chromosome 1. So my question would be actually in early onset Alzheimer's disease, when will you call it as early onset Alzheimer's disease? So try to answer this. It's a very simple questions, uh, question. Try to answer this. Early onset Alzheimer's disease is defined as onset one before the age of. So any Alzheimer's disease before this age, you have to go, better go for a genetic testing, look for a family history, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if, if you have time, read the book, uh, Still Alice. It has a uh, lot of uh, important details regarding early onset Alzheimer's disease. So, okay, uh, this is actually a difficult question, I will say. Okay. Uh, so whether it's 40, 45, 60 or 65, the answer is actually 65 years. Okay, the answer is actually 65 years. So this is a repeat question, uh, which is asked many times, uh, which is the most common psychiatric manifestation of Alzheimer's disease. So try to answer this. Is it apathy, agitation, anxiety, and hedonia. Uh, the Alzheimer's patient comes to in front of your OPD, will you find him agitated, anxious, or apathetic? You should. Yes, actually, uh, you know the answer. It's pretty straightforward. You have to address this part of this uh, Alzheimer's patient also. Not alone treating the patient with donopacil and memantine. Uh, we, sh we should address this apathetic part also. Otherwise, patient ha will have serious uh, problems. Also, there will be problem for caregivers also. So apathy is the answer. It's uh, actually a direct word taken from Harrison. And it's actually a repeatedly asked question. So it's about from studies which have shown that 72 percentage had apathy. Agitation is there in 60 percentage. So regarding the treatment aspect, uh, this I'm dealing just with the basic things in uh, dementia and just with the Alzheimer's and the basic 
the other advanced part we will deal in the next class so stay tuned for the next class so i just wanted to prime you regarding uh, Alch dementia and alzheimer's disease so this which of the following is actually this also is a very easy question i don't think there is a need for a poll uh, uh, but i okay stop sharing Okay, question number 19. Just to give a quick answer for this one. Which of the following is not a cholinesterase inhibitor? We had seen that because of the damage to the cholinergic neurons in the pathophysiology, uh, there is actually uh, decreased transmission, that is uh, synaptic transmission, and there is actually uh, memory impairment. So we tried to uh, give cholinesterase inhibitor so that more choline is there in the synapse and there is increased memory. Improvement in memory. So, some one of the drug is actually not acting as a cholinesterase inhibitor. Which one is it? So, again, someone has some people have made mistakes. Please uh, read the question again. This questions cannot be uh, some made wrong at any cost because these are straightforward question. So the. Answer is actually memantine. Memantine acts through NMDA. So one more drug used to be there previously. Uh, can you answer in the uh, chat box which was the drug previously there, uh, which was re removed due to hepatotoxicity? I, previously, in while studying pharmacology, we used to remember these drugs as Doctor TG. At, that is uh, donopacil, uh, rivastigmine. Uh, T4, one drug, and G4, galantamine. These were the cholinesterase inhibitors. So that is tacrine. Tacrine was removed due to uh, hepatotoxicity. And uh, this is actually memantine, NMDA. So glutamate release, the glutamate excitotoxicity. So that is, uh, so this table you try to remember. It's a short table. Any questions can be asked, especially in institutes. If some question regarding treatment in uh, this is to be asked this can come from uh, this table okay so this is the last question for dementia basics so i think uh, you have to give it a try even if you don't know so let's see so have you heard of this two drugs tarenfibril uh, fulbril and uh, semagestat so these two drugs are actually uh, there in harrison they have given harrison's uh, there are actually two uh, trials were going on. There was a lot of optimism regarding these two drugs in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, during the phase two, it was thought that it will change the course of Alzheimer's disease. But later, during the phase three, actually it failed. Uh, so, because there was less of brain penetration, uh, so that was the reason. So, we have already seen where the, in the pathophysiology where these had acted. So I, I think all of them have answered it correctly. So I think 40 of them had answered. So 93 percentage had answered it correctly. So these are actually acting on the gamma secretase uh, inhibitors. So I think we have summed up uh, everything regarding. So we have covered most of the Harrison part in detail. Uh, and we have covered most of Harrison in a short, course, uh, short period of time. So next week, uh, it's very important. So this actually is a basic stuff we have dealt with. Don't think we have covered almost all. Uh, since you have studied, you must uh, you all all were answering very nicely this time. But next is actually a bit next level. So study the other parts that is frontotemporal dementia, that uh, other drug, uh, other uh, investigations, newer investigations, etc. Read some part of Bradley, etc. Uh, so let's see uh, next time uh, in. Uh, uh, we can uh, in dementia adv advance, we'll do it uh, next level studies regarding dementia so that we crack into the institute, institute level of studies we can see. And uh, again, I will tell you that there will be exam after this dementia uh, modules, two modules, there will be a dementia. Uh, after these two modules, there will be a dementia exam. So with that, I think uh, we'll stop this uh, uh, talk. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patient listening. I hope you have uh, you had got the concept correct. Uh, 
I, I just uh, that uh, pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease is very important. Please, please, please again read that part again in Harrison or Bradley, or read uh, see this video again and get a good thorough knowledge of it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So Mansi ji, I think uh, we have done uh, for this day. Thank you. So let's. Uh, I think I'll just uh, stop sh sharing.